Okay, and together with my co-chairs, Figenia, Kerameggioglu, and Evangelos Gerasopoulos from NOAA, would like to welcome all of you in this session of Urban Action Group. And uh, I can see faces, familiar faces, and uh, people that uh, have joined uh, the last year, uh, Urban Action Group in Athens, but I can see new faces also. So if Ian had prepared a list here so we can circulate uh, a list so we can just uh, put your name and contact details just to uh, enrich the database and uh, participants of this uh, Urban Action Group. Okay, so uh, that was a nice picture from yesterday, from last year, and uh, you, you see that we have uh, almost uh, 35 persons participating. And uh, put some objectives, some activities for uh, last year, for example, to identify and approach city networks and uh, uh, stakeholders and get them involved in uh, year geo and euro geo, bridge the gap between uh, service solution providers and citizen stakeholders, identify and prioritize hot topics like climate change for both adaptation and mitigation, resilience, disasters, energy, health, culture, etc. I'd like to, to, to uh, join the, the new uh, working group of Brazilian cities and human settlements uh, network of uh, GEO. And uh, most of them are addressed individually in several projects. We have some poster presentations. You can see how each project uh, address these issues. But uh, so far, we have not uh, addressed the, this one to develop a portfolio or catalog uh, of required requirements versus solutions and relevant policies as a group, as an action group. Probably this is an objective of the future. And we need also to, to plan for regular uh, meetings and uh, conventions of this urban action group. So have just a few posters. Please uh, join us in the coffee break. And for uh, 2023, some objectives. Of course, this is a forum to foster the dialogue, the networking, and sharing ideas and information and uh, facilitating the building of synergies because we need to develop synergies and to have commitments of uh, everyone in this group uh, if we'd like to, to uh, build something together as a group. Uh, it's still alive, of course, the objective to link with a, a working group for, of uh, geo resilience uh, cities and human settlements uh, network priority. Uh, again, to identify and approach city networks and stakeholders and uh, provide services and link what we're doing with this uh, routine activities in cities. Uh, very important issues is to support the uh, European Union, the Horizon Europe missions. There are two missions, the cities mission and adaptation missions that are relevant to the activities of this group and all people that work in, in urban issues. So uh, it would be great if, as a group or each person individual, can have joint activities to support. So we have uh, uh, invited uh, Mrs. Maria Yuriani from the Commission just to give a presentation on uh, the activities of cities and to uh, try to make this link. Also important is if, as a group or each individual, can uh, contribute to the uh, IPCC special report on cities and climate change. You know that we have the, the seventh, uh, the cycle of the set, seven assessment report of the IPCC and the first special report will be on cities and climate change. And, and I think this is a very uh, important special report for this community, for the urban community, and the potential of earth preservation is high. So we may consider to this also this. Uh, and finally, we have to plan some joint activities as a group and last but not least to support the GRC reporting for the ministerial brief for the J week to be held in November and I think that you have all see these forms sent by the organizers and uh, try to, to address these uh, questions this is table one and uh, three which is related to speakers for example to uh, to give some feedback of uh, how national uh, activities can support Eurogeo or how uh, uh, our, the, our activities in this group is uh, contribute to the Geo Post 25 strategy, uh, which is, of course, as we have seen this report, uh, focus on Earth, on Earth intelligence and what does exactly Earth intelligence means for our community. Uh, or uh, for our speakers, uh, we need to, uh, to have some feedback about the three main lessons in the, the field, about the sustainability of their project, uh, 
and I don't mean also financial sustainability always, but also sustainability in general and how this is linked with the uh, hero geo governance. And about communication, of course, and sharing information about the discussion of this group. So this is the agenda, more or less. Uh, we have uh, planned actually five uh, presentations. Unfortunately, we have a problem with uh, the presentation of ICLE because uh, Dr. Puria is sick. It is not, not possible to give this presentation, but we have all other speakers. And uh, just to recall that this session is recorded, so please just pick the microphone. And uh, we have maximum 15 minutes each speaker. Uh, and also would like to, to remind that the presentation will be available on the website after this uh, meeting. Uh, so if you would like to modify your slides and uh, put something that can be published, please do it. Uh, but please include an IPR statement in the last slide, for example, the CC by 4 Creative Commons or, or something similar. So thank you very much. And uh, I will immediately give the floor to Martin Clark for the first presentation. Thank you, Nick. Good morning, everyone, or bonjour. Um, okay, um, nice to see everybody. So my name's Martin Clark. I'm the Urban Resilience Coordinator at the Geo Secretariat, and I think I'm losing my voice from the, all of the shouting in the castle last night. <clears throat> um, so this is this is my first my first time to uh, Bolzano, my first Euro Geo uh, appearance, as I'm a reasonably new member of the Geo Secretariat team in, in Geneva. Um, I'm one of the four coordinators, <clears throat> urban resilience coordinator. So um, trying to essentially linked lots of uh, work program activities that have a focus on urban either directly or indirectly and also try and communicate the um the mission um of geo sort of outside of the organization specifically at cities <clears throat> my background is um and i'm an urban planner by by trade and um i came to geo and i'll be actually very honest about this i'd never heard of geo before i took the job with geo um but I was very familiar with a lot of the data and the tools that the group is, um, has under its umbrella and have been, I spent the best part of sort of two decades almost um, working with cities, training, capacity building, um, various parts of the world, lots of time in sub-Saharan Africa, South Asia, and of course Europe, um, using some of the data and tools that um, we all are trying to develop and promote. So um, I come at this um issue or the this subject matter if you like from the perspective of a practitioner today um because the resilient city oh, resilient cities next slide um resilient cities and human settlements uh, engagement priority is the most recently adopted geo i wanted to give you a quick overview of the working group that we're looking to establish <clears throat> um, kind of progress to date and next steps and then take a slightly deeper dive into one particular um, project that we're working on um, led through the Secretariat, uh, the Global Heat Resilience Service, which I think is is it's one of the post 2025 incubated projects um, referred to in the post 2025 strategy. And it's through a project like that that I think is best uh, a best example of how we can coordinate, uh, work on something very action orientated, <clears throat> look at the nexus area between various engagement priorities that Geo has, um, and really it's the it's the the first activity if you like that I'd like to see the Resilient Cities and Human Settlements Working Group um, advising on and leading on. Can we go to the next slide. next slide or third slide i should say next slide. yeah so that's it um oh yeah and happy um world habitat day for yesterday i'm not sure if that um if it was on everyone's radar <coughs> 
or whether <clears throat> it passed, passed you by a little, like it nearly did for me. Um, <clears throat> but I suppose we were reminded that, or UN Habitat, sorry, reminded me yesterday that we are obviously living in an urbanized world. And um, yeah, it's always nice to be reminded of the numbers a little bit and the scale of, of the challenge or the scale of the opportunity, because I think quite often um, we rush to looking at the problems that cities cause um, and don't necessarily consider the the opportunities that urban settlements present to us but i mean seven billion people by 2050 and the staggering two million additional people every week that we need to accommodate sustainably and support the growth of resilient cities next slide thank you so as i said before as a, as a kind of urban practitioner, I always think about um, how cities can deliver urban resilience. And really what we're trying to show here is that <clears throat> there are a range of factors that influence how sustainable or how resilient a, a city or an urban settlement can be. Um, and, and just to give a reminder of, I suppose, how I'm looking or interpreting urban resilience is it's the capacity of a city's systems businesses institutions and communities and individuals to survive adapt um, and grow no matter what chronic stresses and acute shocks they experience now there are a range of actors and a range of institutions that are ultimately responsible for guiding how sustainable and resilient cities are and there are a range of influences that determine how sustainable and resilient things like urban services are that support that resilience. Data and information is but one of those inputs, if you like, to ensuring our cities are more resilient. <clears throat> and that's obviously where the bulk of geos um, offer, if you like, lays. Um, but there are a range of other reasons why just data on its own isn't going to guarantee urban resilience. Um, that said, um, data and information underpins all these other um, influences, how much investment a city is able to attract, um, the level of skill or capacity that those working on planning and managing cities actually have, um, the level of coordination that we could expect, as well as influencing things like laws, policies and regulations. So data is, is kind of the cornerstone, if you like, the bedrock of, of urban resilience. and. Um, for that fact, I think um, GEO, through its work program and through the regional GEOs <clears throat> and the work of some of its partners, very well placed to be able to inform urban resilience, not least because although we have a dedicated SDG, SDG 11 on cities, um, something like 60 or 70 percent of the SDG targets in some way relate to cities and urban settlements. Um, and sort of baked into that is also the fact that we need earth observations, spatial data um, to be able to measure and guide progress towards some of those targets. Next slide, thank you. So where are we now? As I said before, it's the most recent of the um, of GEO's engagement priorities. So two to three years ago, um, the wheels were set in motion, if you like, um, through UN Habitat requesting assistance from GEO to establish uh, an engagement priority around urban. <clears throat> and there's a few steps that have followed since then in terms of having that formally adopted through GEO's governance, um, the drafting of an engagement plan, the hiring of an urban resilience coordinator, myself, um, and then looking forward to a couple of steps, uh, which I'll go into a bit more detail presently um, to how we call for nominations for members to that group and then really turn the engagement plan into more of a an action orientated uh, plan or terms of reference for the working group. This is also um, being developed in, in parallel to a cross work working group survey that was carried out earlier this year by the Secretariat, which was really looking at the current operating model of all the working groups, climate change, disaster risk reduction, data, capacity development, with a view to trying to 
align, um, streamline the way that these groups operate. They're all very different in their membership, uh, the modes of operation. Um, so there was a series of recommendations that came out of the survey we conducted with the current working group members and members of different work program activities, which basically pointed out four or five um, recommendations that were adopted um, by the program board to look at the modes of operation, try and standardize the terms of reference for all these working groups, um, review the membership um, or provide a process for re reviewing the membership and developing some cross, some kind of standing meetings on joint working group collaboration and coordination. Um, and then lastly, really to look to the working groups to help implement the post 2025 strategy, um, including the two incubated projects, um, the Global Ecosystem Atlas and the Global Heat Resilience Service, which I'll talk about shortly, um, to the working groups to really guide the next generation um, for the next 10 years of, of GEO. Next, please. So we're not, for the urban related stuff in the work program, we're not starting from, from a blank slate. There's already um, a, a number of kind of discrete distinctly urban focused activities in the work program, the Global Urban Observatory Initiative, the Earth Observations for Sustainable Development Goals, Urban Toolkit, <coughs> uh, Geohuman Planet, to name a few, um, plus many other activities that in some way relate to urban, and I dare say I've missed some here already, um, as well as the activities that the regional geos, like the Urban Action Group here, taking forward. So it's not from a, 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 a blank slate we're starting. There's already a lot of activity um, relating to urban and cities in the work program. Next slide, thank you. Um, and so what does the engagement plan say in terms of what the Resilient Cities and Human Settlements Working Group should be doing? I mean, essentially, it's trying to match the supply with the demand of Earth observations as, as they relate to human settlements which I suppose is kind of stating the obvious in a way. And then there are a, a number of, I'd say, priority areas in which um, the engagement plan sets out how this group should operate. The, the most important to me anyway is really, and as Nick has already mentioned before, is, is how we better engage and put cities at the center of the conversation around what types of urban, uh, urban related earth observation data and tools that we need and how cities can be involved in the design and development um, of those. There are a number of others that are all, they're all quite generic at this level. And really the task now is to try and translate the what do we want to do into the how do we actually do that? So things like helping implement and monitor the national urban, sorry, new urban agenda. Um, yeah, look for collaboration across the different geo work program activities, support the regional geos, all fairly um, generic things, which need now detailing and articulating in, into a sort of plan of how we do this. Next slide, thank you. So through the, the survey that was conducted for the working group, um, we had some reasonable insight in how we might go about doing some of these things. Also, through a lot of the conversations I've had with organizations like city networks and in some cases cities themselves or or development partners working and supporting cities. There's a few other ideas kind of coming to the surface that that we'd now like to translate into an action plan. So <clears throat> as I said, really first and foremost is to, is to open up the membership of the working group to those who are actually representing the voice of cities. So that could be the city networks, the C40 cities, the resilient cities, the ICLAs um, of the world, make sure that they're at the table when we're discussing um, how GEO can best meet their needs. Making sure that the, the, the products, the tools, the data that is being produced is relevant to cities Again, that may sound um, very obvious, but I think we need to ensure that not only are we present at the kind of global and regional events where policy is set in terms of how we guide sustainable urbanization, 
but we could also work harder to ensure that cities can understand um, the links to and the contributions they can make to some of these global goals <clears throat> and really thinking about how we link not just evidence to policy but beyond that from policy to investment and action and then some more kind of um, shape around how the working group would actually operate itself um, these were all suggestions coming through the survey that we should try and keep the size optimum if that means in to order to ensure that the group is effective um, and is actively working on or action orientated deliverables and outputs there's coordination across regional geos uh, geos other working groups and also consider some kind of on onboarding of per, uh, onboarding of members relevant to the cause in which the, the working group is guiding so the next steps um, and this is true across all of our working groups at the Secretariat is to implement the recommendations from the survey. Um, uh, the first output, if you like, from those recommendations was to convene a, a coordination meeting or a, a session where all of the working groups come together to discuss common issues. And that will take place at Geo Week in Cape Town um, in November. So perhaps we'll see some of you there. The whole of the Secretariat team will be be there at that time. Um, more specifically on the resilient city side will be well, we've begun long listing and then we'll open a call for membership to ensure that we've got some of the, the folks from the logos you see on the screen present. Um, in many ways um, we've already begun engaging with some of these groups through um, what I think is going to be the first task for the working group, and that's to guide the development of the, the Global Heat Resilience Service. Next. So I'll just spend a few minutes now, if I have a few minutes. Two minutes. Yeah, two minutes. Just giving you a quick pitch on what the Global Heat Resilience Service is. Some of you have seen this before. As I said, it's one of the post-2025 incubated proje projects that has come about through a series of workshops where we looked for nexus areas across the geo work program areas in which we felt geo could make a really decent contribution to understanding global issues. Um, and really this service is designed, it's a city focused initiative that would generate data and insight to help cities understand health risks from extreme heat. And then to act on those and mitigate those risks. Thanks. I mean, in a very quick nutshell, I shouldn't maybe have to remind people why heat resilience. We've had one of the hottest summers on record in the Northern Hemisphere, certainly. In fact, the last two summers, so it's a persistent issue. Um, we live in a, in a warming planet. It's only going to get worse, and cities is where you find um, concentration of exposure to that hazard. Next, thank you. And we also see of all of the climate-related hazards and natural disasters, exposure to extreme heat is where exposure is concentrated, particularly for younger age groups and the elderly, the most vulnerable, the urban poor, people living in, in substandard accommodation with poor access to green space and open space. Um, so a very pertinent and pressing issue. Um, and I mean, Europe, to be fair, has, 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 has borne the brunt of it, certainly this summer, um, and the, the summer before with, with many tens of thousands of preventable heat related deaths. Next slide, thanks. So this is a particular, as I said, a particularly urban challenge because that's in urban areas is where we find the concentration of population exposed to a variety of climate hazards, but extreme heat in particular, Asia and Africa, where you find the biggest numbers in terms of the size of the cities, but also the numbers of people exposed to extremely hot days. Um, and also these are the parts of the world that are arguably least able to cope um, in terms of having access to decent risk, risk knowledge and um, solutions which they may then be able to employ to mitigate the risk from extreme heat. So this concept is, is literally at a concept stage where we have a an outline for what this service could be and should be, um, a suggested um, number of inputs on the data side, things like meteorological and climate models, 
exposure mapping of where people, infrastructure and other assets are in relation to those hazards. Um, some community based mapping of heat and social vulnerability, noting that it's not always possible to well essentially you need to understand people's experience with heat in order to really round out your risk knowledge um, and then the wealth of socioeconomic and public health data that already exists and this would be brought together in some kind of platform that hosts the data allows cities to interrogate their own levels of risk <clears throat> and the reasons for that risk um, and then going beyond just identifying the problem in terms of who's exposed but looking at some of the solutions that cities can use to mitigate those risks it's going to require a lot of engagement with cities co-design of the service with cities and partnerships from various sectors um, international agencies private sector community-based organizations city networks and we'll necessarily have to go beyond just providing data but we anticipate some capacity building technical support in terms of building the capacity of cities to get the most out of the platform and the service um, next slide thanks so just very briefly this is the kind of um, the kind of needs opportunities and challenge that we need to unpack and unpick in the design of the service and I'm very much hoping that the resilient cities and human settlements work group can can provide strategic advice here as well as um, ensuring there's very strong links with the urban action group Eurogeo to help us answer some of these questions as we design next slide thank you and really just the the the, the kind of next steps um, very broadly is as we round out 2023 will be to We've been doing a series of kind of events um, throughout the year just to raise awareness of the project, um, get partners interested, including city networks and individual cities. And we'll round out the year with um, a presentation of the service at Geo Plenary in Cape Town um, and, a, and a scoping workshop just to try and develop a theory of change for the project so that as we go into 2024, um, and convene a sort of more comprehensive meeting of potential partners, we'll, um, we'll host a workshop in early uh, 2024. And maybe go to the last slide, I think, and we're, and we're done. Thank you very much. Thanks, everybody. We can do the next presentation. From uh, Ms. Maria Yurgani from Commission, be given online. Yes. Yes. Thanks. Good morning, uh, Nectarios. Uh, good morning to all and many thanks for this uh, invitation to this very valuable and timely event. Uh, are you projecting my presentation, Nick? Okay. Okay, so I'm going to update you on the climate neutral and smart cities mission. I'm sorry, I hear my voice two times. Is it okay that you hear me well? Yes. There is no return of a sound. Please go ahead. It's okay. Okay. Uh, so I'm going to update you on this 
ever biggest uh, operation that we have launched in the European Commission uh, in DG Research and Innovation. Um, I am working in this DG uh, for uh, 31 years now. And I can assure you that having seen a lot of framework programs launched, uh, starting from the FP5, FP4, FP5, and so reaching uh, this Horizon 2020 and Horizon Europe, this is the biggest ever operation that we are launching to achieve 100 climate neutral cities by 2030 and beyond achieve uh, the second and third wave to reach climate neutrality by 2050 and to achieve the targets of the European Green Deal to reduce the emissions by at least 55%. Uh, next one, please. Uh, so we have launched, uh, we have launched an expression called for interest that is two years ago, and we received uh, 377 applications. Uh, we reviewed all of them with the help of independent experts also. And we selected 100 cities from uh, uh, the European Union and 12 from associated countries uh, to Horizon Europe. So the first climate, the 100 climate neutral cities to be by 2030 are working on their climate city contracts. And these cities, uh, will act as uh, experimentation laboratories, living labs, to show the way for the climate neutrality journey for the rest of the cities to become climate neutral by 2050. Next one, please. Uh, you see that uh, these 100 uh, cities uh, which were selected and uh, they represent 12%, a very good percentage of the EU population. And also, so here you see the 100 selected cities from which member states, and also you see the associated countries. So you see that there are 12 uh, cities from associated countries to Horizon Europe participating in this, uh, in this operation. Next one, please. So what are, just to very briefly inform you, uh, the main elements of this mission is that we have a really holistic and cross-sectoral approach. Having said that, is that this is not only the operation of uh, DGRTD, but it's the whole European Commission and all the general directorates dealing with urban issues and cities that are sitting together in the mission board. Uh, of experts and where we are co-designing and co-implementing uh, the city's mission. And also we are discussing and launching together the work program, Horizon Europe work program to implement the mission. Uh, so uh, it's a co-creation, really co-creation and really cross-sectoral, first of all, across the commission. And we, we uh, encourage that this model is applied also at regional and national level. Having said that, uh, we are very much looking forward uh, to cross-sectoral cooperation, for instance, at national level across ministries dealing with um, urban and city-related issues. Uh, so these 100 cities and 12, they are helped, they are supported by a Horizon 2020 project, Net Zero Cities, uh, and this Horizon 2020 project is being called now Mission, Net Zero Cities Mission Platform. You can find all announcements and uh, next competitions, next uh, work program calls under Horizon Europe, uh, under the Net Zero Cities portal. Um, I, I'm going to share all this information with Nectarius to share it with you. And there you can find all the open calls and of course, you can access this mission platform is a knowledge platform uh, where you can find all existing in EU initiatives, EU calls, EU programs uh, that are supporting and funding cities. And of course, you have access to the solutions. All cities have access to this, uh, to the existing solutions, to EU funding, uh, because this mission has the purpose, the aim not to live and to forget and to leave 
anyone behind this operation. Uh, so this, for the 100 cities, this mission platform provides technical support, provides financial advice, uh, provides regulatory advice, so how to overcome regulatory obstacles, and where to seek information on other EU uh, funded programs, on other EU uh, initiatives, create synergies with other cities, create synergies uh, with other European programs, national programs, and um, regional programs. Um, and, uh, of course, is advising and supporting uh, the first 100 cities to uh, create, to co-design with their citizens. Citizens' engagement is at the heart of the European mission, but also, as I said, the cross-sectoral approach, the holistic approach, multi-stakeholders uh, approach, so all actors concerned. So these climate city contracts are not really contracts, but they are the commitment of the mayor or of the main representative of the mayor to commit on a climate action plan an investment strategy and um, on city governance and citizens engagement. And uh, this so commitment is a long-term commitment. And uh, we have received for your information, the first uh, 12 climate city contracts have been submitted or commitments have been submitted to the European Commission. Uh, there was a review process still undergoing, and we are about to announce the first cities uh, which might receive the label of climate neutral. So this with these cities, uh, let's say that uh, their commitment uh, to become climate neutral cities has been recognized. So uh, they they have reached uh, um, fully detailed uh, climate city contracts and uh, fully detailed commitments to climate action. Uh, the mission label, a lot of you will be asking what will help. This, of course, gives more visibility to these cities to participate, to open the door to other, uh, to other regional private uh, development projects and uh, to European projects, of course. Next one, please. So um, the cities uh, which presented their 12 climate city contracts have been this, uh, these contracts, these action plans have been, uh, have been reviewed and are still under a review process. Uh, but as I said, results to be announced uh, very, very soon with a press release, first of all, and then with possibly an award ceremony. Um, so this, these commitments, as I said, include an action plan, an investment plan. And uh, of course, uh, this city's mission departs on different points because other cities are more advanced in their climate uh, action plans, others are less advanced, but that's why uh, we are starting with the first cohort of cities. Uh, preparing their climate city contracts. And there is a second cohort that we are very much looking forward to see, uh, to see them submitting uh, their climate city contracts by the cutoff, next cutoff date is, uh, is mid-October. Uh, next one, please. Um, so as I said, the Net Zero Cities platform uh, which is called the so-called mission platform is an online portal with a knowledge repository, technical advice, technical solutions. This is open to all cities, not only the mission selected cities, but to all cities to share so that every city can prepare and prepare their commitment, their action plans, their climate city contracts to become climate neutral by 2030. Next one, please. Uh, regarding now the funding, the funding, of course, there are a lot, a lot of opportunities. I'm going to show it in, then I'm going to refer it to the next slide. Uh, from European funding, for instance, the European Structural Development Fund, uh, the Urban Initiative Actions, first call was open, now there is the second call uh, with deadline in September, now in September. So there are a lot of opportunities at European level also the Horizon Europe calls to implement the city's mission 
on green urban regeneration and greening, on sustainable mobility, on positive uh, energy districts. So a lot, a lot of opportunities from the European, uh, the European uh, funding. But also we are encouraging and we're looking forward because this is also needed to private investment on cities, to private developers, to private firms. So that's why we invite uh, all stakeholders to participate from citizens, local authorities, construction sector, industry, uh, private consulting companies, private innovation firms to participate in the so-called cities mission. Next one, please. Um, okay, thank you. And so uh, I think I mentioned all that already that uh, the Horizon Europe calls, there were a lot, there are several calls which you can see under Horizon Europe mission calls. As simple as that, I'm going to send to Nectarius uh, all these sites, but also you can uh, see on the Net Zero Cities portal, uh, there are a lot of calls on uh, to implement the city's mission. Next one, please. Uh, I mentioned all that, the positive energy district, the urban green, renaturing for urban regeneration, resilience. Uh, uh, next one, please towards everything towards climate neutrality the online portal of um, the online portal of the city's mission and also i would like to mention and to invite you to some activities uh, which exist in which uh, for instance the city science initiative connecting the academia the city's municipalities uh, uh, encouraging a network of city advisors to advise technical advisors uh, resilience chief, chief officers to advise the mayor when deciding and launching and implementing his climate actions or her climate actions. And so this, uh, this is uh, under is an initiative which is supported by the Joint Research Center, GRC, uh, DGRTD, DGRIGIO, DGEAC, and of course, uh, uh, the agencies, the executive agencies, RIA, CINEA, who are implementing the program and the calls and following our research projects. Um, you can is register to the community of practice and you can also contact me if you wish to participate in the network of 45 signatory cities. Uh, let's say like a um, neutral advisory board and a third space to advise the commissions with the challenges and needs for the cities. Uh, just for your information, there is the theme on urban resilience, heat island effect uh, is free. So nobody developed this theme. There are a lot of chapters like on energy, on climate, on social innovation, on health and well-being, but this theme has not still been developed under the City Science Initiative. I can connect you and you can be part of it and participate in meetings which usually take place at the municipal libraries of the cities and uh, there all different stakeholders are connected and they share the solutions applied in their cities, but also their challenges and problems existing in their cities and how solutions can be replicated from one city to another, but also raise their voice to the commission what is needed. So this is uh, one initiative. Uh, the other initiative, um, the other thing which I would like to mention is that, uh, as I said, there are the 100 selected cities, but there are also the cities which did not make it to the first call. So there are the non-mission cities, as we call them. So a lot of opportunities exist for the non-mission cities, uh, like, uh, for instance, uh, um, uh, like... Um, uh, like, for instance, under
I'm sorry. <laughs> I continue. Uh, so, as I said, under the Net Zero Cities, the platform, you can find all the opportunities existing for the non non mission cities like pilot calls. Uh, these calls are launched, are often launched under the Net Zero platform and also the twinning uh, calls, twinning calls to twin with the pilot cities selected. There is the first uh, cohort of pilot cities selected, uh, 53 pilot cities selected and there, there was a call uh, with deadline uh, this September of twin cities to twin with the pilot cities, which were the mission cities, basically. But there are the cities which could twin with the mission cities and exchange their learning experiences and solutions. As, as we said, um, we don't want to leave anyone behind. The first 100 selected cities will lead the way and will serve as experimental cities to invite the rest of European cities to participate in this operation and become climate neutral. So I will stop here to leave maybe space for some questions. And I don't want to monopolize, of course, uh, this uh, excellent meeting. Thank you very much for your attention. OK, thank you very much, Maria. And probably you can provide some clarifications of questions in the round table and discussion uh, we have at the uh, half an hour from now. Uh, so I can give the floor to Stefan Fritz and Nuri Castell to present us the uh, project. So, yes. Uh, <laughs> Hello. Yes. Good morning. Yes. Okay. yes. <laughs> Okay. Um, number five. Number five, yes. Oh, somebody is talking about net zero cities at the EuroGO conference. Yeah. yeah. She was from the commission. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> we, we can hear you, yeah. by the way. <laughs> did you, did, ah, yes, you were in the meeting with Gazal and Ali and me, right? Yeah, where they, where Gazal said that positive. So, sorry, we can hear you. You, know. <laughs> you are talking in our yeah. session. Can you please? Hmm? Yeah. yeah, it's. Okay. Yeah, now you're muted. Thanks. <laughs> okay. Uh, um, it's a real pleasure to be here with you. Um, my name is Stefan Fritz. I'm from the International Institute for Applied Systems Analysis. Um, and I will be presenting uh, this together with Nuria Castell from NILU. Um, this talk is represented by three sister projects, which is um, uh, CityOps, GreenEdge, and Urban Relay, um, represented here by these three, three institutes in the lead. Um, we start yeah. with the. You want to see it? <sighs> you have other things to do. I thought. Sorry. Yeah, we can just sit here. Sorry, can you hear us? We can just sit here. We can just. Somebody watch is it. in the call. We need to mute this person. <laughs> we don't want to hear any conflict. <laughs> Sorry for that, too, please. <laughs> okay. Um, so um, the question is, you know, what is really citizen science? And citizen science has has really a long history. You can go back to the 19th century, um, around 1900s. Um, you know, there was the famous Christmas bird count. And people, instead of shooting birds, they were asked to count birds. Um, but in the meantime, um, citizen science has really evolved a lot. And in particular, in this specific context, you know, beside the knowledge production more broadly, citizens are involved in, th there is a very strong focus, as you can see here, in co-designing co and in the active participation of citizens in, in science and in knowledge production. So really citizens playing a very active role and being a, an equal partner to the scientists. So co-identifying, um, next slide.
so co-identifying research questions you know, we may have to get it up again sorry about that I'll just wait a bit um, so yeah the co-identification of, of research question is a big one next slide thank you um, co-designing plays a, a really important role um, unfortunately you can only see half of the slide here there is a whole ship with citizens and the citizens need help and you have to work together it's really important and having this co co-design and co uh, um, co-production approaches play really an important role especially especially in the in the urban context um, but we also have like then like the citizens observatories yeah we also have then the citizen observatories. It's also about engaging citizens, but the focus is not so much on the science because citizens can also contribute with their data to policy and influencing decision making and having this co-creation, for example, of citizen-led actions, working together with here before also like in these neutral cities where we want also to engage citizens. So citizens can do more than collecting data. Citizens can contribute also to scientific and policy advancement. And traditionally, um, and also now, citizens have, next slide. Ah, we are, we are off again. No, there are no slides. There was a slide before, but. Anyway, I will just continue because we will otherwise lose time. You can just listen. Um, so besides the birth count I mentioned, citizens are now very much involved in environmental citizen science. So that's really a field by itself. Oceanography and marine science. There is also seismology, earth science and geography, biology. Traditionally, a lot of contribution by citizens have made in the field of biodiversity, biology and wildlife conservation, as well as astronomy and, and space exploration. Um, also, more recently, <laughs> citizens can contribute quite a lot on in health and medicine research. Um, there was a very interesting Zoe study in the UK just very recently where masses of citizens, uh, thousands have contributed to measuring their um, blood pressure, um, sugar levels and so forth. It's really, really interesting. Archaeology and anthropology, as well as citizen social science, where there's really, really a movement around the, the, the social part as well within citizen science. And, and as Stefan said at the beginning, this is also like now there are three new EU funded projects. And all of us have this vision of contributing with citizen science and citizen observatories to a greater uh, temporal and spatial availability of citizen observations that can complement other in situ observations at local, national, and EU level for policy and research. And how are we going to do that? So then we have. Next slide, please. Uh, yeah, oh, yeah. <laughs> so then like what are we going to oh it's a little bit hot also like the images I don't know why but it's okay so we are going now to introduce you to three new these three new EU projects city ops is the one I'm coordinating the main focus is on building citizens observatories for air quality okay oh. the main um, the main focus is on using citizens observatories for air quality and in order to do that we will be using these sensor systems that can collect data and then there's like ones that you can have static but also mobile and wearables where people can, can carry themselves and also not on the shelf city sensors that you can buy but also engage citizens in building their own sensors and have this agency. The data when validated can contribute also with uh, other data as officially 
official monitoring, and you can see here in the, in the pictures that official monitoring stations, for example, in one city, we might have two, three of them, while when engaging citizens, we can really have much more data, like, for example, expand these three, that's in Christian Sand, in the south of, of Norway, expand it to have, like, 50 sensors monitoring in the houses of residents, and also, like, we had, like, 20 bikes going around collecting data. When this data is validated, it can really contribute to have this. You don't see it, it's a black box now, but it's a high resolution air quality maps. And when we manage to make those, this data interoperable, not only in the lo local level with Christian Sun, but also make it interoperable with other cities in Norway, other cities in Europe, all this data can truly, truly serve also at the European and at global scale to uh, address challenges. And of course, this data, it's important. It not only goes to us, to the practitioners, to the scientists, but it also goes to the policymakers. And there is like how to make this data decision ready information that is used and also back to the citizens so they can also have together with policy these citizen led actions at local level. So besides also measuring air quality, for example, in the city of Athens and Riga, the Urban Relief Project, which is um, led by IASA, um, really looks at nature-based solutions that can provide a cooling effect. So there is a strong emphasis on these nature-based solutions, particularly greening. Um, and we focus additionally also to this very important thing of thermal comfort. So this relates a lot to the previous presentation we've heard on understanding how people are affected, how their health is affected, how comfortable they feel and how this changes through space in the, in the cities. Um, as we know also vulnerable groups in particular are many times much more exposed to urban heat islands than more wealthy people. More wealthy people tend to live much more in greener areas um, and, and that's why we, we want to also increase the amount of a green space and want to contribute to existing tree registries. So uh, trees do play and will play a much more important role in the future in trying to cool essentially cities. Then our, oh, <laughs> that's very pixelated, but that's okay. Uh, we had another project, Green Gauge, also focusing on the sustainable mobility, that where, where it's also very important, sustainable mobility in the sense of also contributing to air pollution and climate change. Here, we'll, they will also have use of sensors and imaginary to, to know how the people move within the city, how the cars, and also use this data to provide uh, data that uh, urban planners can use to build more resilient cities. These, these pictures are unfortunately a little bit computer edit. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> some AI tool went over this. I don't know why. Sorry about that. Yeah. Um, I just pressed. What can we do now? Ah, yes. Um, of course, there are still a lot of challenges around citizen science. Um, one important one is being also the acceptability and the quality so that cities can really, um, you know, accept this new data stream from citizens. The amount of data is also always a challenge. But besides that, um, there is still a lack of metadata. Standards are not established in general interoperability and accessibility of citizen observatories uh, uh, it, it are, um, are not there and data is stored in different multiple databases. Um, also, there is a lack of common semantics. Um, also, still, you know, within citizen science, there is a lower participation among women, vulnerable communities and minorities, marginalized groups. And it is also the goal of these projects to focus in particularly in on those groups and get them on board participating in citizen science. Uh, yes, and um, there we think that 
also what we've seen before, um, you know, making this real link to citizens and understanding the needs of citizens, there is a very strong link to the Urban Resilience Working Group uh, and to GEO as such. And there has, citizen science has big potential contributing to GEO by extending the spatial coverage, by validating some data, some remote sensing products, also by building more local capacity um, and also in particular to raise more public awareness and engagement around what satellites can do, what GEO can do um, and uh, as already said to really foster this dialogue and collaboration between the public, scientific organizations, governments um, in order to really reach a more integrated approach. Um, So we see a huge potential with citizen science and citizens observatories to contribute to GEO, adding this uh, source of environmental information that can complement in situ data. Also like having this important, if we want to have this data into the GEO space, we really need to increase interoperability and accessibility of citizen science data. And that's something we will be working in this three projects and leveraging, leveraging the power of citizen science and citizen observatory for <coughs> urban resilience. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, both of you. So we have questions to the round table. So this is yours, probably. Yeah. Okay, uh, next presentation, last in line by Tilo Erbejeser from DLR related to air quality issues. So. Okay, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Nick, for the invitation and uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, yeah, I'd like to present you a quick overview on DLR's activities on, on uh, global air monitoring in the first part of the presentation. And in the second part, I would like to uh, emphasize the need in combining earth observation data with uh, modeling to address the issue of uh, environmental health risk assessment. Now, uh, I'll be rather short on this, but we see really a lot of uh, operating uh, satellite missions in space. These are just the ESA developed ones and we see science missions, Copernicus missions and metrologi metrological uh, missions. And this is a vast amount of data and uh, our major objective, I know how this works. So, I mean, the problem is we have this vast amount uh, of data and a lot of technical issues also with the data. <laughs> and uh, now what we need to do is to reduce the amount of complexity of all this data and, and provide and really translate this uh, yeah, vast amount of information and data into information that is really uh, needed by local authorities and by uh, implement for and to support the implementation of policies and international programs. I think that's the key issue. Uh, like implementing uh, GEO and finally uh, realizing and uh, the challenging uh, sustainable development goals of the United Nation. And uh, now it would be better to have it with slides. I mean, I can talk for hours. Uh, <laughs> you all fall, fall asleep. Ah, yeah, very, very good. <laughs> so I just talked about uh, this brief introduction on global urban monitoring from space in reducing and decreasing the volume and complexity to really address the, the information products that are needed to shape sustainable and resilient cities, as uh, Martin had said. Our baseline portfolio for doing this is the world settlement footprint, and I'll show you some examples, really just a quick uh, rush through some images here. And um, this is an openly and freely available data set up to 10 meter ground resolution on a global scale, and it consists of 
like uh, settlement extent, uh, imperviousness of the surface, population distribution, settlement growth on an annual base. So you can see the increment of the settlements uh, on a global scale. And uh, we have also a new um, addition to the portfolio. It's the building height and volume in cubic meters. So this adds the, the third dimension, which is really required when doing uh, urban climate modeling, because we need the lower boundary condition. And yeah, in light of the upcoming event, the Geo Summit in Cape Town, I have chosen uh, Cape Town. We see here the urban footprint of the buildings of Cape Town and the imperviousness of the surface and uh, the uh, yeah, people per pixel, so the sort of a population density. This is very important when addressing the exposure and health risks due to heat stress or air pollution. Then we have this uh, three-dimensional product uh, uh, you see really this uh, very well uh, developed product here for Tokyo in New York uh, and this high variability in the, the building volume actually. And so it was the first worldwide 3D mapping of built environment that we published with Thomas Esch in the lead. We have also this uh, yeah, settlement increment uh, year by year from 85 on. Here it's shown uh, Cairo and the Nile Delta, and therefore we uh, process the entire Landsat archive up to seven million scenes uh, together with Google Earth engine. And uh, well, we can use this data then to do well a consistent global analysis of uh, settlement and population growth with respect to the SDG 11 3.1. And uh, so we can also disentangle the uh, income country level and throughout the years and see which countries develop in a more sustainable manner and in a more well, a less sustainable manner um, over the years. So we can see also the transformation like from, uh, from a lower middle income country to upper middle income country for China um, and also India. So to add a further dimension, uh, when we talk about environmental health risks on a global scale is, uh, the, is air pollution. And we see here the global human footprint of air pollution. It's a NO2 mean from 2007 and to 2019, which was compiled from daily global overpasses of the Metropgom 2 meteorological instrument. And we see NO2 as a short-lived tracer for anthropogenic uh, pollution. And it's clearly in red and to black colors stick out the hotspots, the mega cities and industrialized areas. And of course we can uh, use the multi-temporal component of this data to retrieve NO2 trends, pollution trends that we've presented at the Juicy Conference organized by Nick this year. And uh, so we see like for the mega cities on the one hand side and left hand side, uh, mega cities in lower middle income countries uh, that have an increase in pollution of up to 70% per year. And on the right hand side, we see cities from high income countries which have a reduction in air pollution, so improvement of the air. And we have packed all these purely Earth observation based data records into uh, our next GEOS pilot some years ago to fuse this information. Uh, it's a global service where you can select any area of interest and then on the fly, we retrieve from the data uh, records with a web uh, processing service uh, records of the um, air pollution development over the years. So it's a fusion of world settlement footprint data, atmospheric composition data to finally uh, derive information that is needed is the total health burden. I mean, that's the quantity we are interested in finally. And now this brings me to the second part of the presentation. And I will really emphasize the need for an integrated assessment of urban climate and health risks. I mean, a lot of attention is paid to heat stress or others work a lot of on NO2 effects uh, on, on the health, but we cannot select what we are exposed to. We are exposed to multiple environmental stressors in our daily exposome, the environment we are living in. So we have this combined effects of several stressors that affects our organism depending on age, activity, genetic deposition. And this results in a stimulus response in health endpoints defined by a spectrum of various diseases, unfortunately. And therefore, I would like to emphasize that we need the global scale observation by Earth observation satellites, but we need to go onto the street level to really address the exposure, the individual exposure that we are 
suffering or that we are exposed to each day. And therefore, we need to combine the satellite data with atmospheric modeling, as you can see here uh, throughout this, uh, from global to mesoscale, further down urban scale, street scale. And we need really this scaling approach, which was also highlighted by the Benuria and, and uh, Stefan uh, to really address also the citizen science level, citizen level, uh, the individual level, and to derive the big picture out of it. Now, when it comes to urban climate modeling, I show you a very new result. It's a pump for use simulation of the Hamburg city center. It's uh, the NO2 pollution resulting from road traffic, and it's done in a minute time resolution in a five by five meter spatial resolution. And Palm for You is really has been developed over the last 10 years in a German research project involving all institutes in Germany mainly. And uh, it's a building and turbulence resolving large eddy simulation model uh, for entire cities. And the new thing about it is it is also, and this is what we're working on DLR now, it's nested into uh, the coupled chemistry climate model Mekon N, which results from the ECA massive family. So we can really do climate scenarios and bad urban climate modeling in large-scale atmospheric predictions up to 2100 or 2200. And this is realized by the supercomputing center and collaboration of DLR with LRSAT. And uh, yeah, just to briefly have a look at this uh, urban climate model, it's the cutting-edge community model, including all relevant processes that we are aware of uh, when concerning urban surfaces, chemistry, radiation impact, also interfaces between vegetation, soil, groundwater. And uh, just to show you some quick examples, uh, this is a uh, modeling for the whole city of Munich uh, at the five by five meters. And we see here the emissions from each car in Munich around the, the ring here, we can see the, the ring road. And all these individual uh, emissions really result in this uh, big plume. So the individual visions are linked with the urban canopy layer, the urban boundary layer, the mesoscale circulation. So we get this urban plume, which can be measured by satellites like Tropomi and also by aircraft. And uh, we can also take a look at hotspots. Like this is the most polluted city in Germany. Unfortunately, the Landshuter Lane in Munich. And so we can really do detailed studies here on NO2 and uh, heat stress levels along this road. And we can also resolve this uh, resuspension and recirculation effects in the street canyon uh, very well up to uh, the uh, urban boundary layer. When it comes to uh, heat stress, uh, a continuation of what Martin said, I think that's very important. Often, we, uh, when it comes to Earth observation, we discuss the land surface temperature. What we actually need is the air temperature that is measured by meteorological instruments. But finally, we need the thermal stress. I mean, this is really important, and you have also said it, um, uh, that we that this is much different though the heat that the people are really perceiving is much different than the air temperature this is measured in some yeah artificial climate in these meteorological stations so therefore we need this fine scale modeling and also here a one by one meter resolution uh, modeling of the UTCI and where we can really see the large variability in this small area, it's 1,000 by 1,000 meters, and you can see here on the right hand side the large variability of the UTCI, whether you have like a shaded backyard or a street on the east side, on the west side. So for exposure analysis, we need this information. And with respect to citizen science, citizen observatories, we also have uh, done a study combining Earth observation data with indoor uh, extremes, and we can see that this works very well. Uh, so a lot of citizen science data has gone into this 200 measurement devices to have really these uh, indoor extremes during a heat wave for a lot of uh, people, like 10% are exposed to. We need as an input for the models, uh, high resolution uh, surface models, like from Worldview, and we also need a data from Earth observation about cities, uh, urban green space. So this is the official catastrophe for Munich, but we see that the actual green uh, space is much more uh, variable and a lot more trees are there. So we need uh, the Earth observation data of the urban green space to really do the proper modeling of the uh, urban heat resilience. And uh, finally, we have built, now I conclude, several 
pilots based on these uh, Earth observation based data within the ESHA project that was coordinated by Amin. Um, so, pollution health risk profiling in the urban environment, a pilot that was coordinated by Evangelos Garasopoulos, and there we have built um, in a co design process with users air pollution health risk pilots, like for the Munich metropolitan area with several quantities related, like aggregated risks from all these individual stressors. And we also uh, contributed to this uh, platform of health surveillance air quality pilot that was coordinated by NOAA, by Evangelos, um, to showcase uh, studies uh, around the world. So my take home message is to conclude is, yeah, it's not, nothing new now that <laughs> Earth observer data is very, uh, enables a consistent global monitoring of the urban environment, but we need to combine the satellite data with numerical simulations to make cities livable, um, healthy and climate resilient. And therefore we need to combine really good models, urban climate models with Earth observation data. There's a strong need for this integrated assessments of climate change and health risks in urban areas. We need to further develop the tools and user-driven services in the context of EuroGeo that have been launched in eShape. And uh, I think, yeah, we might be happy to contribute to Geo's urban heat and, and uh, health incubator here. We are striving for a continued uptake in science planning and economy with all these partners uh, and to bring uh, Geo and EuroGeo um, <laughs> to them. And I would like to thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Dilo. Thank you very much. I'd like to thank all the speakers and uh, we have 10 to 15 minutes, so I will give the floor to Evangelos Gerasopoulos for the moderation of the discussion. But if any one of you had not put the name here, just please complete your details in order to have the main list. Thank you. Evangelos. Okay, so uh, thank you very much for being here. I must admit that there have been amazing presentations covering different, you know, uh, parts of the discussions where we want to have from, from the global uh, trends and initiatives that we are taking at the uh, GEO to what is Europe uh, doing in the relevant domains and then uh, the no doubt important role of citizen science and then science itself reflected uh, today through DLRs uh, and uh, what Dilo has presented. So uh, I, I will put a frame so that we have a discussion around this but don't hesitate also to uh, raise uh, burning questions to the speakers because it's a privilege to have some of them uh, all of them here with us today. So this is a EuroGeo action group. So at, at the top, we have GEO, who is ha which is having the fourth engagement priority and the working group. So actually we have to find a way uh, of some working arrangements between the EuroGeo action group and how it can fit the working group. And at the other edge of the world, we are having the cities because actually what we are discussing here needs to be implemented in the cities and we want to find the right means, the right frames that our results can really reach the cities. It's okay that we discuss about, you know, means to collect the needs, means for us to have the solutions, but uh, to the point that this go down to the city level and get implemented, there is a big distance and we need to discuss and address this uh, as uh, well. Uh, we saw that uh, from uh, Maria that tell you that these frames is absolutely amazing opportunities to do that because it's the only way to process to, to, to reach cities and say that okay guys you have this obligation you want to become climate neutral you want to become resilient we have these tools for you to achieve the goal so it's a nice way to start uh, this discussion and then I go back to yesterday's discussion that probably national coordination mechanisms can be the interface to reach cities at the local level and you know exchange information between the big picture Euro Geo and Geo with the cities at the end of the day so within this frame let's have a discussion here and I will start from the bottom the cities itself so I think we have together with us here uh, a representative from uh, the Covenant of Mayors, if I'm right, right? Albano, 
uh, Kona. So I would like to, to, to put you on the spot and sorry for this, but I would like two minutes from you to say what would cities expect from a group like that and from GEO and from Earth Observation in overall. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Evangelos. Actually, I am a former Covenant of Mayors policy coordinator. Uh, I am Albana Kona. I am a scientific officer at the uh, Joint Research Center in the European Commission. And actually, I am supporting Eurogeo uh, regional nodes. So it's good. Actually, I look forward to move from cities, from Covenant of Mayors into Earth Observation Science because what we have, we have cities that are really engaged in becoming climate neutral, but their data is crap. They, they, their data, unfortunately, for, for the bad wording, but uh, what they need is data, what they need is infrastructure. So I'm very happy to see here a very active group on providing data and infrastructure to cities, to, to local officers to enable them to have monitor the data and then to do a proper strategy to uh, then reach climate neutrality. So I would like to understand, I have a question for you now. <laughs> How do we become active in these working groups? How are you going to shape these, uh, the thematics in the working groups? Yeah, I think I could answer, but the best person to answer would be Martin, I guess. So you just pass the mic there. I'll, I'll start. You can uh, you can round it off. Um, I mean, the, the the simplest way is, as I mentioned before, for for the the kind of secretariat level working groups is through a call for members, so that we ensure we have organisations like the Global Covenant of Mayors invited to join the group, and therefore sitting next to the science um, and research institutions that are doing lots of this amazing work, like we saw from DLR and, and DLR there. Um, I think the other thing to, I think then there's a, there's probably another stage that Evangelos is alluding to where it goes beyond just, you know, making geo and its data and tools and product visible to actually moving towards an implementation piece. But I think it's impossible for us to reach out to individual cities without the help of representative organizations to actually extend that reach. So I think there's this, this kind of like come to the table, the, the visibility of everything that GEO does. And then there's the, the co-design piece that we heard about where you're actually shaping the design of some of these tools and data mm -hmm. so that they actually match the needs of those working in cities, as opposed to us telling you what we think you need, if that makes sense. Excellent. So actually we have all the first two steps. Step one, there's going to be a survey launched by the Geo Secretariat asking for needs and requirements and stuff like that. So all the networks will be contacted and individual cities and they have to be active in filling this in. Step number two is that the networks are highly uh, wanted to be represented in the working group and put their lens, you know, in the way that we're having the discussion and try to make progress. This is uh, number three. Then I would turn to Maria. If Maria, you, are you still with us? Uh, because it's, I, I talked about the frames. It is very important that those people behind the frames are aware of the potential of Earth observation. And actually, they trigger their partners when they submit proposals to reference or make use of Earth observation. So I would ask Maria, are you with us? Can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you. Excellent. Thank you, Maria. So I was wondering whether you are um, putting the flavor of Earth observation within the mission for, for example, climate neutral and smart cities when you are launching the projects or when you are talking with the different cities. We have examples that we have been involved in uh, this endeavor of the cities and we have been presenting the Earth observation and the opportunities are amazing. But are you also doing in the, in this from your uh, uh, perspective? Uh, look, I'm going to reply to these questions by first of all telling you that we are not reinventing the wheel in the for the mission. So we are using whatever exists, whatever has been funded by EU projects, by national projects, by regional projects. And so when there are existing already tools, existing data, we 
we encourage the cities through the mission platform to make use of them. And so not to reinvent the wheel. So as I see, you have wonderful tools existing uh, where you need to work with them. There are several opportunities uh, because I understand that uh, so data is needed for the cities. This is also a common requirement for the city science initiative, connecting cities with academia and with private sector. So I would suggest two ways for you. One is for sure to join the city science initiative, create a whole chapter on under city science initiative, because this is exactly where you can raise your voice, where you can create network synergies, suggest priorities to the commission. And also the second uh, opportunity exists under the, um, uh, the horizon calls for the implementation of the mission, but also under the calls that the net zero platform is financing, again, supported by the European Commission and Horizon Europe. And these are on the pilot cities, pilot cities calls and the which addresses the mission cities, but there are also the twin uh, cities program. This is learning programming, changing experience with the pilot cities to increase uh, impact, to increase also participation. Uh, so that would be your second entry. Uh, for that, I wish to say that the next call for twinning cities, twinning with the pilot mission cities will open in early spring 2024. And also I would like to mention another opportunity under the regional development, because I heard the word infrastructures for cities. You know that under the urban innovative actions, innovations also are funded by uh, DG Regio and by the, um, uh, the European Regional Development Fund, uh, uh, which is again, it's to ensure the transfer of knowledge and to test innovations. So you, I think you are entering in this. This is your third uh, entry point related to the infrastructures. Uh, the last call for the urban innovative actions was closed, um, but there is a new call coming up. I can connect you with the officer uh, because we are working, as I said, the mission, the city's mission is not an operation run just by RTD. Uh, we are connected, all the DGs, we are sitting around the table, we're exchanging the information, and we are trying uh, to work cross-sectorial and to, to be informed on the calls that each one of the general directorates has. So I'm going for this, for the infrastructures to connect you also with my colleague, Pia Laurila. Excellent. Okay, thank you, Maria. That has been very straight and informative um, reply. You want to add something? Can I also can I also say something? You of have course. an opportunity also to be updated on the city's mission latest updates, but also uh, to raise all the questions uh, during the European Week of Cities and Regions, which is taking place next week. And I would encourage you. I'm going to send uh, to send you the the three sessions to quickly register. First session is on the city's mission. Uh, this takes place on Tuesday uh, in the Square Convention Center. I'm going to send all the details at 2.30. So it's one hour and a half. It's totally interactive. You can raise all the questions, you can create synergies, and you can be updated. This is the first chance. Second chance is on 12th of October, Thursday, is the City Science Initiative. You have then the chance to meet with the City Science Initiative stakeholders and with the 45 um, uh, signatory cities of the CSI with all the officers, Rijo, Pia Laurila, for instance, GRC. Uh, this takes place 9.30 on Thursday in Brussels again uh, Square Convention Center, and third opportunity is the historic cities uh, meeting. Also very interesting to connect with them. Uh, it's a very big cluster uh, to renovate cities, historical city centers, who I'm sure they will be very interested in the tools that you already have. This takes place on um, on uh, 11 of uh, on 12th of October. 
and the CSI takes place on 11 of October, 9.30. I'm going to send this information. Okay. Really very big opportunities for you to connect and to discuss. Good, thank you. I think you have uh, enlightened some of the pathways that uh, we could use in order to raise awareness about Earth observation. It's not just all data. I mean, uh, it doesn't necessarily mean that uh, the cities know exactly about Earth observation. And I would also like to stress out that in the calls that are coming out under the missions, in most of the cases, there is a requirement to connect directly to the community of practices of the missions. And maybe us, as a Geology Action Group, should do that a little bit more officially and pass you know, spread the word of Earth observation in these communities uh, of practice, both in the smart cities and neutral cities, but also in the climate adaptation, which is very urban uh, relevant. So maybe this is another uh, way to, to promote our uh, work and engagement. Okay, I'll stop it here and I pass the word to uh, Mark, who wants to comment. This is Mark Dowell from JRC that's gonna be speaking. Yeah, thanks, Evangelos. Um, so as far as other ongoing activities, I just wanted to mention something else that I think may be of interest to, to this group. Uh, so I think many of you know that we started a couple of years ago this new European Commission Knowledge Centre on Earth Observation. Uh, and we do a number of assessments of kind of the needs for e in EU policy for the use of Earth Observation. Uh, through a series of deep dive um, exercises. And the current deep dive exercise that we're doing is on climate adaptation with the urban focus. Uh, so this started um, in late spring of this year. Uh, we've already had a series of uh, discussions with the relevant DGs in the commission. Uh, we have five DGs who are proposing use cases uh, uh, on uh, uh, this. So uh, DG Env, DG Rijo, DG Impa, DG Mare, and who am I forgetting? Impa, okay, five. Ah, Klima, of course. <laughs> um, and so we're starting to develop these use cases. There are actually some colleagues in the room that are involved in supporting us in this exercise. Um, I think one thing that's coming out that I just wanted to throw out there, of course, I don't want to prejudge the, the final conclusions of this assessment, but one thing that's coming up, which I kind of heard in some of the presentations this morning, but not explicitly, is really how in the urban setting in particular, the issue of policy coherence and decision in the decision making process becomes extremely important and in how we can use earth observation to address this so if we think of urban heat island effect urban greening um, um, uh, air quality uh, water resource management all of these things are interlinked with each other so that when we speak to the policy dgs they're saying you know, this is what we want you to focus on, but we're also interested in this and this and how this affects it. So I can imagine if that's true at the EU level in EU policy, it's even more true at the level of the city planners and things like this. So I think that's something we should bear in mind is that we are the purveyors of objective data and information which should be used together in a comprehensive way to address kind of these policy coherence uh, type issues. Um, we also had a workshop last Monday, uh, which some of you, I hope, were, were able to follow, and that allowed us to extract other uh, kind of information from the, the stakeholder community on this. So anyway, the report, uh, the study is going on now. We expect the report to be out in quarter one of, of next year, and uh, I'll definitely make this uh, available to the action group, uh, uh, and hopefully it provides some impetus to follow up uh, mm -hmm. on things. Okay, that. thank you very much, Mark. Actually, I would say that what you mentioned about this holistic approach that is undertaken by the European Commission but needs to go down to the city level is actually what I mentioned yesterday in the morning, in the opening, about the transformative program, a program that can really see holistically the picture and uh, approach the different stakeholders, like the cities in this case, in a similar manner. So I think maybe this is the next big action for this group to do this mapping, the mapping of all those opportunities, the phrasing and the wording that we need to be using in order to approach them and the means in order to approach them in this way that you also uh, mentioned and uh, pass this uh, message and this roadmap to the whole community, urban relevant community within Eurogeo and start you know, implementing this type of approach. And I think the next steps 
uh, will come through the participation of the cities in the groups, etc., etc. So another comment from Nicola. Thank you. Um, on my side, I'm um, always a bit skeptical on the capability of the cities to absorb the data and the model and what we are able to provide as a tool uh, in their operational workflow. Some cities have some competence, GIS competence, uh, inside uh, the metropolitan area. Sometimes they have a, uh, an agency of urbanism, but many cities are relying on third party consultancy companies, for example, to provide such services. And uh, I was asking myself if there would be some kind of uh, classification of maturity or, or capabilities of this or that city to onboard directly uh, our services and how big is the gap? Absolutely right and very practical. Two re replies. The first reply also, I don't know who mentioned, one of our tools is co-design and we know it very well from ESAP. So if the whole process is run by the concept of co-design, these aspects should be discussed somehow, okay, and find tailored solutions. There was a recent call of proposals when this was taken into account and cities were asked, uh, do you want to come on top and have a solution and we help you do a training? And Maria also talked about training opportunities in the infrastructure, etc., etc. And this was the case. There were other cities that they really had these dependencies on companies building the GAS platforms, etc., but they just could go under a subcontract and try to make use of this interoperable solution that we plan to be you know producing throughout eurogy and stuff so i think in this context you are absolutely right but there are ways to resolve i think we are done with time i don't know if there are any burning questions or coffee is more burning than that uh, all in all we would like to thank you on behalf of our co-chairs i don't know nectarius if you want to uh, close the session just to close uh, just to, to remind that there are some posters of the urban session in the uh year one, two, three, yes. And uh, we we'll report one slide with some the main points and key points and the conclusion of the session tomorrow, the plenary. And if again, I will give this report. So I would like to thank again all of you for uh, participating. And uh, I think that uh, I think this group is start becoming more active and there are much more opportunities as I said before. Thank you very much. So, good time. <laughs>